Well, welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here with us today. Today's an exciting day uh, to be together uh, and to get to continue a series that we're in, uh, but have a unique sort of conversation today that I'm really looking forward to. We've been in a series in the book of Acts. Uh, we have been looking at the story of Jesus, uh, who has risen from the dead, uh, meets with his uh, apostles, his closest followers, teaches them about the kingdom of God that is coming, uh, and then ascends into the clouds. His followers wait there in Jerusalem for the promised Holy Spirit to come in power, uh, which does at Pentecost, and the church begins, and this new era begins to be ushered into the world. So today we continue the series as we begin to see the apostles engaging uh, in the ways that Jesus engaged, doing the things Jesus did, uh, signs and wonders and incredible things happening around them. And today we engage a subject of Peter healing a man who could not walk. And I'm also very excited to be up here with Tracy. Um, I get the pleasure of introducing Tracy Matoda. And I've known Tracy and Mike for the last year and a half that you guys have been here at The Vine. And Tracy, I remember when I first met you, and really every other time that I've seen you, the thing that really <laughs> jumps out at me is just your big smile and your enthusiasm for life and your joy. It is always such a pleasure to be together. I've gotten to know Tracy uh, quite well the last few months. For the last eight months, we've been doing spiritual direction together. And if you don't know what spiritual direction is, I'd love to talk to you about it, but it's basically sitting down together Together and listening to the Holy Spirit and exploring how God is how God is moving in our lives together, and so that has been just a joy. Uh, Tracy works for Johnny and Friends, which is a nonprofit that encourages and serves uh, people with disabilities, and uh, that has been such an amazing ministry to hear about, uh, the way you share Jesus's hope with people all over the world. And you also work with churches to help create uh-huh. safe spaces and healthy right. spaces for, for people with disabilities, uh, which has been uh, really helpful to me as I process um, how, how we engage people here in our congregation. Tracy is also a part of our speaking team. Mm-hmm. Um, the speaking team is a team of people that meets behind the scenes to go through uh, the passages that we're going to be speaking on here on Sundays. And, and it's the whole purpose is to have a group of diverse voices um, speaking into the messages that we uh, get to share here at The Vine. And so we're just honored, Tracy, to have you here with us today. Thank you. Yeah, I'm really excited to be here and to get to share um, not only from Scripture, but also from my own experience. And uh, yeah, when we were meeting with the speaking team, last month, and we were talking about this passage, I had shared that I have lots of thoughts um, about healings and whatnot. And so uh, Micah and Sarah kindly invited me to share uh, some of those thoughts with you all. But just so you know a little bit about me, um, I was born with a genetic condition called spinal muscular atrophy, which is a progressive neuromuscular disease. And I have been a wheelchair user, power wheelchair user, since I was five. Um, and this year marks 40 years of being a wheelchair user. Uh, and so obviously throughout my life, um, as I've read the Bible, lots of different healing scriptures have, um, have stood out to me. But this one has always been one of the most important to me. And that's because I felt it has been the most relational and also immediately restorative um, scripture. And, and that's something we're going to dig into a little bit more here today. Awesome. Thank you, Tracy. We're honored to be here with you today. Uh, So a little bit of a disclaimer. Um, uh, Different people use different language around these subjects, and we're going to try to be as tactful as we can with the language that we use today. For instance, in the NIV and the translation we'll be reading today, it speaks of a lame man, and we're going to change that language to a man who could not walk from birth. Um, In other cases, uh, we're going to use language of uh, people with a disability. And Mm -hmm. uh, in some communities, that's not the preferred language, but I understand that is how how you prefer to refer to it, so how we'll be speaking of the, of the subject today. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. I prefer to say um, I live with a disability, I'm a person with disability, and I'm a wheelchair user. Um, but preferences and, and comfort levels with, with words are different for everyone, um, so it's important to know the person you're speaking with and understand what they are comfortable with. But for me, a person with a disability and wheelchair user works. Perfect. All right. Well, hey, let's dig into our text. We are in Acts chapter 3, beginning in verse 1 today. 
One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at three in the afternoon. Now, a man who could not walk from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went into the temple courts, uh, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. What a powerful and beautiful story. I don't know about you guys, but when I listen to you read it, Micah, I hear a little jingle from Sunday <laughs> school in my head. So if you, there's a song, I will not sing it for you um, today, but I, what a powerful story mm-hmm. and so much joy is in this um in this story as we read it. Anytime we open up scripture and we take a look at what was happening uh, specifically in the first century here, um, it's really important to think about the context. It's really important to think about the culture in which this story took place and uh, the readers that would be reading this story to, so that we can understand first in the h- how to understand the story from the first century perspective and then from our perspective um, as well. And so this story is speaking about people with disabilities, and people with the disabilities in the first century sadly were not treated well. They were sadly marginalized and often outcast. There were considered unclean, ceremonially unclean. Mm -hmm. There were even uh, certain people with disabilities who were considered untouchable, and people wouldn't wouldn't touch them for fear of them becoming ceremonially unclean. Mm -hmm. Persons with disabilities, uh, because they were considered unclean, were also were generally not allowed in the temple. And the temple not only was the place of worship for um, the first century Israelites, but it was also the heart of the community. It was where networking happened and conversation happened and alliances between households happened. And so not to be able to go into the temple was a really big deal. There was a common misconception and belief that a disability was actually uh, some sort of curse or punishment from God because of sin, either sin of that person or sin of the of of their family. Um, I love the story in John nine where Jesus heals the blind man and totally dispels that misconception. Uh, but that was a common common belief, and so most people who had a disability in the first century weren't um, offered, weren't given the, the same opportunities and status in the community that others were. And many of them uh, became beggars sitting on the side of the road near a public place um, asking for money. And the temple court uh, near the temple gate was a very popular place to beg because not only were people going in there to worship, um, those, those same people were also being encouraged to give alms to those who needed it. And so often as you were in Entering into the courts, um, the the roads would be lined with beggars on both sides. So we have here in the text today the story of Peter uh, healing a man. And this text is certainly reminiscent of the many healings that we saw Jesus perform in, in his ministry and life on earth. Uh, in the first four books of the New, New Testament, the gospel accounts, we read uh, frequently of Jesus entering these places and healing people. Uh, what's interesting is in most of those stories, it's, it's Jesus doing the healing and the apostles watching what happens and learning from their rabbi in those moments. Uh, there are some limited times when they're sent out with some signs to perform in towns that Jesus is going to move towards, but those seem kind of more limited experiences, and they seem more like glimpses of what is to come as opposed to the the, the primary focus while Jesus uh, was was on earth and and leading his followers as a rabbi. So what we see here is this... this, uh, 
passing of the baton. We see this, this step forward as now the stories are of Jesus' apostles, his closest followers, now accomplishing the things that he was once doing on earth. And this is kind of the story of discipleship. A, a rabbi would disciple his people. Their purpose in life was to know what their rabbi knew and to do the things their rabbi did. And, and this, is, this is that beginning to take place. Now we see the apostles accomplishing the things that Jesus had been doing in his ministry on earth. Hmm. Yeah, you know, verse 4 of this passage where it it's explicitly says that Peter and John both looked at this man in the eye, that's the first verse that really drew me in. Um, I can only imagine all the people who may have passed him by and tossed a coin at him, but never saw him as a man worthy of respect. Um, and, you know, I don't know if first century, uh, if in this culture, if... I, Eye contact, looking at someone in the eye was a sign of respect, but I certainly know that's how we can interpret it. And so for me, having John and Peter both look him in the eye and invite that same eye contact from him really just shows me that they saw him as uh, someone made in the image of God who was worthy of their relationship and attention and who was not just an object of pity. So they were definitely relational as they engaged with this man. And as Peter uh, said to, to him, look at me um, in the eyes, he also said, silver and gold I don't have, but what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus. Stand up and walk. And what a powerful, what a powerful statement. Um, often when I read scripture, and it's the case in, in this story as well, this narrative, I wish I had more details. I wish I have so many questions that I want to explore f- further. One of the big uh, things that I wish was included in this text was more details about Peter's inner dialogue with the Holy Spirit. It is evidenced, um, I believe, by the healing and by the praise and celebration that happened after this healing, that God wanted Peter to speak these words. God was inviting Peter to heal uh, this man, and God empowered, uh, through the Holy Spirit, Peter to perform this healing. He was gifted in this moment. And so praise God for what uh, an amazing healing um, that took place here. I love this. And also, I'm curious about... Peter's inner dialogue. I'm curious about the discernment piece. Like what's, how do we discern what God is inviting us to, especially in the moment? You know, he's walking, there's a crowd, it's noisy. In the moments as we're going about our life, how, when we, we feel somehow led to do something or nudged or we have this response within us, how do we discern if this is maybe our own personal emotional response to a situation or maybe it's the food we ate last night and it's (laughs) indigestion, like, oh, I'm feeling something, or it's the Holy Spirit inviting us to step into a specific role. There are so many ways that God invites us continually to give and to engage people. Uh, here, we see Peter being invited to heal. Other ways God invites us to, to engage and to give are through material things. Right. Maybe not the coin, but some other material thing. Or maybe it's our time and our presence, our friendship, our encouragement. Maybe it's the sharing of the good news of Jesus. Um, Tracy, you you give a whole lot in your ministry at Johnny and Friends. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you do in that ministry? Yeah. So the ministry of Johnny and Friends, for those that don't know, was uh, started uh, 45 years ago by Johnny Erickson Tata, who 57 years ago now, um, she dove into the Chesapeake Bay and became a quadriplegic. And so uh, in in realizing the, the role of the church and the role of other Christians in her life, she felt called to begin this ministry uh, to serve people around the world and in our own country as well um, in ways that would help them grow closer to Jesus. One of the things that, uh, what I get to do at the ministry is lead the response department, where we hear from about a thousand people a month from 
Right now, uh, so far in 2024, we've heard from 94 different countries. So that's a lot of different people who are seeking um, encouragement. They're seeking resources, um, prayer. So we get to really step into the lives of people who are facing hardships and be able to provide encouragement, the hope of Christ, um, and also share uh, practical resources as we are able. And one of the things I'm always touched by um, when you mentioned time uh, and presence is people will tell us how much it means just to have a listener. Sometimes people feel like no one wants to hear the hard things. And so knowing that there's another person on the other end of the phone or on the other side of that email who heard your story and wants to help can be so healing in of itself. It's inspiring, uh, just what you do, and, and thank you for that. And uh, what, the way you describe it, it, it is so relational. You know, it, it's it's a job, it's employment, it's all those things, and yet your passion is that is it is relational, and, and it's caring for, it's concern for people, and seeing each other as people and created in God's image. And so, in this text, I'm I'm struck by um, Peter and, and John doing a, a similar thing. You know, like, they, they could have tossed a coin. That's what the guy was asking for. They could have kept walking. And yet, the fact that they stop and look him in the eye and invite him to do the same and then give something unexpected in that moment created such a beautiful opportunity. Whereas they could have uh, faithfully done what a man asked of them by walking by and handing him a coin, uh, they give so much more. And it creates such an opportunity uh, for this man man to come to know good news of Jesus, come to know healing power, come to know new opportunity and restoration in life and all the things that will follow for him. So it's just striking to think about the many experiences we have on any given day, the ability just to move beyond them, uh, but the ability to stop and in relational context, context to, to make eye contact, to engage a moment can open up such beautiful opportunities and doorways. That's right. And, and going into verse 8, um, where he is healed, and this is not just about his physical ability to walk, which was a gift, of course. He, he wanted that, I'm sure. He had been um, obviously unable to walk since birth, um, but it also allowed him to go into the temple right away. Right? He was healed, and he was immediately restored to community by being able to go into the temple. And I just think that that is so beautiful. He'd been sitting outside those gates for years. How many times had he wished he could join those folks and go into the temple? Uh, I think in that moment, he instantly went from being pitied to part of the community. I think many of us can relate to the feeling of uh, being invited and then the feeling of being not invited mm -hmm. and how drastically different those mm -hmm. two feel. You know, so this story, as, as we read this miraculous healing, this narrative, it is both relational and it is restorative. And there are other examples throughout scripture, especially in the gospels, of healings that are both relational and restorative. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of in Luke 8, um, uh, we read of Jesus walking uh, down a road with a crowd following him. And there's a woman who had been bleeding for 12 years. And um, with her condition, she had been to many doctors and none of the doctors were able to heal her. And because of her condition, she was considered unclean. So it would have uh, isolated her to her home. She wouldn't have been invited to go in a crowd. She wouldn't have been invited to go into the temple and all, and all those places where, where people gathered and mingled. And it, she heard Jesus was walking by with this crowd and she snuck out. She snuck out and she sneaks through the crowd to simply touch Jesus's cloak. And as she touches his cloak, she is healed. And, and again, I think about Jesus could have kept walking and Jesus chose to heal the woman, and that would have been a beautiful story. But instead, Jesus stops and stops the whole crowd and draws attention to this woman. Mm -hmm. I'm sure in that moment, she would have been mortified, <laughs> like, oh my goodness, I've just been found out. And yet Jesus's purpose for drawing attention to her was to invite her back in and he back into community. He said, he calls her daughter. He says, daughter, your faith has healed you. And so we see this, this examples over and over of Jesus engaging uh, people in a both relational and restorative way. 
You know, there's another story of Jesus and a healing that we won't focus on the healing in this case, um, but it's a story of a blind man named Bartimaeus, uh, a man who was blind um, named Bartimaeus. And uh, what, what really stood out to us, and we discussed previously that I, I look forward to digging into, is Jesus' question leading into it. Um, talk about relational as opposed to just doing for the guy what uh, the guy needs done. Uh, Jesus uh, starts with a question, what do you want me to do for you? You. And it almost seems like it would be obvious. Well, of course, you know what you know, the guy's going to ask Jesus to do for you. And yet there's such humanity and tenderness and beauty in the pause to, mm-hmm. to speak to this man and to ask what's actually a poignant question. What do you want me to do for you? Yeah, I think that's one of the things that people are often surprised to hear from my story is that although I've my disability is quite significant, obviously. Um, I've actually never desired God's healing, physical healing from it. Um, I, I feel that because my disability has never precluded me from community and relationships, um, I have a family that loves and supports me. I have a fulfilling career. I have a wonderful husband. I get to be part of this church community. Um, I feel like all of those things have given me this contentment and blessing that I just have never sought healing. Um, however, a lot of folks um, are surprised by that, um, and a lot of people in, in my life um, have not taken the moment to approach me and ask. They make the assumption. Um, and I have memories of people, mostly strangers, approaching me in public um, to pray for my healing from the time I was about five. Uh, and Most recently, there was an example of a couple who approached me at the mall. I was just browsing by myself, and uh, this couple came over to say hello, and I thought, well, I don't think I know them, but hello, and um, they said, oh, we're Christians, and I said, well, that's nice. I am as well, and and they said, well, we just came over here to pray over you, and um, this was not my first time going through this, so I knew it was coming next, and so I shared a little bit about my truth with them. I shared about my disability. I shared about the work I do at Johnny and Friends, and I offered them um, a way they could pray for me. I asked them to pray that God would keep equipping me and providing for me so that I could continue to minister to people who were hurting, Um, and sadly, they were not in line with that prayer. They said they needed to pray for my healing. Um, and, you know, I've, I've, like I said, I've had this happen many times throughout my, my life, and yet it still shakes me up a bit. Because in what that tells me is that they don't see me as whole. They don't see me as, as worthy for the kingdom. They don't see me as purpose, living out my purpose for God. They're, they don't know me they are seeing a, a physical ailment and thinking that that must be uh, something that needs to be fixed. And, um, you know, I just, I continued to share my truth with them. Uh, I told them how they could pray for me. And then I exited. And all I can do is pray that that conversation and was a seed planted in them, that they could start to see people, all people, as worthy and made in the image of God. That's... That's a tragic and hard situation, and I want to thank you for the poise and just the um, Christ-filled grace with which you are able to engage things like that, and also thank you just for uh, the the last year and a half of relationship and the things that we've been able to learn and the things that we've been able to grow uh, grow in because of the way you've chosen to engage with us and with so many other people. Um, I just want to say thank you because I've been on the wrong side of some of these conversations. <laughs> we probably all have at some point, and I'm so thankful to have a friend who's willing to help guide and, and, and allow us to learn uh, as, as we continue in our, in our Christian walks. Yeah. You know, it's fascinating as, as you share the message you're receiving from those types of interactions. Um, it's heartbreaking when we don't see God's fingerprint yeah. in people that are different than us, right? Right. Mm-hmm. When someone's different than us, then we assume that they're they're broken in some way. And you're saying, no, God has made me whole in That's this right. body. God has created me this way. And it reminds me of Psalm 139. I want to I want to read it. Yeah. I know this uh, passage is important is. to you. <laughs> uh, Psalm 139, verse 13. 
For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just love that. I think if we can trust that scripture is true, then let's look at each other as made in the image of God. God knew what he was doing when he made me, and he has a purpose and a plan for me, and I am so thankful for that. And um, so, yeah, I just, that scripture in particular is very impactful. That is so inspiring. Thank you for sharing your story and, and yeah. allowing us again to learn and grow through that experience. Absolutely. So as we consider this story, this narrative of this healing, I'm struck by the hope and the healing that is found in Jesus. There is so much to to, to be thankful for. And there is so much hope and so much healing in serving and knowing a God who loves us and a God who sees us, sees exactly how we're made, exactly how God is calling us and how, how we're engaging and a God who loves us and wants to heal us. And sometimes that healing is physical Mm-hmm. And we praise God when we, we have those miraculous healings. Amen to that. And also, sometimes God doesn't heal mm-hmm. us in that way. Sometimes God heals us in other ways, in, in ways that are more emotional or psychological or spiritual. However God chooses to heal, I love uh, seeing how God takes our wounds and God takes our pain and creates something beautiful. And God shines... God's divine light into those dark spaces in our, in our hearts, in our minds, in our lives, and just illuminates and uh, lavishes us with divine love and divine hope. And so, friends, we are invited as we process this story, as we hear your story, we are invited to pray for the healing that we desire. We are, God is asking us that question. Jesus asked Bartimaeus, what, what would you like me to do for you? We get to ask that question and go to a God who is listening and say, here, Lord, is what I desire. Here is how I would like you to heal me. And also we get to hold those requests with open hands. We get to hold those desires with the posture that Jesus demonstrated when he prayed. And he said, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. Knowing that God may choose to answer our prayer exactly how we're praying, or God may choose to answer it quite differently. And either way, we can trust that God is good, that God is loving, and that God will take care of us. You know, additionally, uh, there was this thread of... of the relational element throughout our text today. And I think uh, we're also invited in this text to consider what does it look like to live relationally, to live uh, in the context of uh, Christian community, um, to more fully reflect a triune God as we learn to live in community and work together to know each other and to be known by others. Um, I think each of us has opportunity today to ask, what does it look like to slow down in those moments, to look a person in the eye, to engage a little bit differently in our lives? We are a people invited to restorative relationship. Yeah. I just love that reminder that Each of us is desiring from Jesus something unique and different. And so I think just the encouragement to seek ways to partner with one another in whatever our friend, our new friend, our old friend are seeking from Jesus. Ask those questions. They might be seeking physical healing. They might be seeking spiritual healing or emotional healing. I think supporting one another in discovering our spiritual gifts is another way that we can be in relationship with one another. The body of Christ needs each of us and the gifts that God has given us. They're unique. So let's build each other up in those and allow each other space to discover and and use those. And I also think let's just strive to know each other well. Let's see each other as co-laborers in Christ, not objects of pity, of condemnation, or of service. Engaging with curiosity and respect and love. I Mm -hmm. love that. Thank you, Tracy. Let's uh, conclude today with a prayer. Dear God, we thank you that you are a God who sees us. So we thank you that you are a God of invitation, that you are a God of healing and hope. Lord, that you are a relational God and that you are a restorative God. 
We thank you for the example in this story. We thank you for the example in Tracy's story. And we ask that as a community, Lord, you would teach us how to engage with all people well and how to engage like you would engage with love and respect and curiosity. Lord, may may you work through us, transforming us and transforming our community. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.